Hello everyone, uh, I'm really honored to be here uh, today. I'm John George, I'm an interventional cardiologist at Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I have an esteemed uh, colleagues here with me uh, from all over. I have Dr. Tamala, who's an interventional radiologist at the University of Miami. Uh, I got Dr. Wickman, uh, who is uh, from University of Florida. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Saab, an interventional cardiologist uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, just freely about uh, radiation exposure and uh, the procedures that we do in our cath labs and angiography suites and uh, you know what we can do to try to reduce our uh, exposure and minimize uh, what we uh, you know, expose ourselves to every day. So gentlemen, um, just generally speaking, uh, what do you guys do for radiation safety in your labs? Uh, we actually have a quality initiative now to try to reduce radiation during a lot of these procedures that we're doing, especially as these cases are becoming longer and longer and more invasive, especially in terms of CLI and so forth. Um, a couple of things we're doing is obviously limiting the field of view with shutters. Uh, we're making sure the eye is as close to the patient as possible. We've actually uh, purchased some shields that are movable and can be moved around the room and around the table and the patient. And uh, we're using, typically we're setting all our machines for low dose radiation as much, as much as possible. I think uh, one of the things we're doing in limb CLI and limb salvage cases, just like uh, Dr. Saab and these guys have really been the leaders in this and at the forefront is using ultrasound as much as possible for as much of the procedures as we can. Uh, and that's really helped reduce the radiation dose tremendously. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think those are all the basic things that we're taught as part of our training, right, to limit the SID and, and uh, take all the, the lead precautions with uh, uh, low frame rates and uh, exposure rates and, and all those things are kind of kind of basic. The, th the other things that we're trying to do is kind of figure out the, uh, uh, the best way to kind of navigate these long cases yeah. with minimizing the overall exposure to everybody in the room. So it's not just an individual protection, but it's protecting the staff and keeping them um, out of the way for uh, the long DSA runs and things like that, so taking a few steps back, yeah. kind of along the lines of the inverse square law. So that's kind of, again, it all comes down to the basics, I think. Mm -hmm. One of the, the, the most important things is, is radiation safety and exposure, not only to the physician, but to the staff and to the patient. And, and one of the uh, uh, initiatives that we started in our institution uh, is to create what we call interventional ultrasonographer position. So we actually have trained our ultrasonographers to uh, scrub in with us in the procedure to, uh, to, uh, to perform what we call extravascular ultrasound imaging, not only to obtain access for these uh, peripheral vascular procedures and critical limb ischemia procedures, but also to direct and guide therapy, uh, thus reducing the amount of fluoroscopy and radiation. Um, another thing that we incorporated uh, in, in, in our practice is utilization of other imaging modality other than fluoroscopy and, and contrast. Uh, for example, the use of intravascular ultrasound significantly reduced uh, the amount of radiation exposure for a lot of those complex procedures. Uh, it's, a, it's a bonus when you're trying to do these cases to have uh, um, another imaging modality, but, but also on top of it also reduces your exposure to radiation. Absolutely. I think, I think we all know that the bulk of the radiation exposure is when we're trying to cross a lesion, a complex lesion, and uh, manipulating wires, devices, and if you can minimize even that with alternative uh, sources of, of imaging like ultrasound, that would significantly impact it. Now, all of you are CLI operators in these complex cases. What do you do about positioning around the patient? Um, you know, the contralateral leg or the ipsilateral leg um, when you have long, complex occlusions. Um, are you changing the way you position the patient on the table? Uh, we talked about ways to reduce the exposure from, uh, you know, obviously the time and shielding and equipment, but what do you do with patient positioning? Um, I think one thing that we're doing, we do a lot of anti-grade sticks because we do a lot of you know, distal disease, below knee disease, and you know, we find that by doing anti-grade access that we're able to really, the eye and everything is further down on the patient. 
we're able to put shields in front of us. I think from an ergonomic standpoint, it's easier for all the occupational, musculoskeletal injuries that you can get. And I think that's helped us tremendously. Be interested to see what uh, you know, Fadi and Brett have been doing. Yeah, I agree. You touched on a very important point. Um, having things ergonomically correct as much as possible. Um, we've all done. We've all found ourselves in these unusual positions where we're maybe having to lean into the radiation source in order to access the foot. So we ha we have a whole talk about uh, the most ergonomic position for the patient. As well as, the, as well as the operator or the physician. So we like to work with everything in front of us, not reaching over the table, not looking over your shoulder uh, because of all the orthopedic things that can come up, uh, but, but as well as the radiation exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one, one thing sometimes uh, we, we emphasize to, to uh, uh, fellows or early career members is, is, you know, they have to be familiar with the equipment. So to give you an example, uh, um, for example, I know, and, and multiple vendors have multiple different programs uh, proprietary to them, which is uh, basically a computer algorithm to, to reduce the amount of radiation and exposure to the, to, to the patient, to the physician, and to the staff. So as, as young operators, as new operators, uh, always, always try to explore these options with the equipment that you're working with, if, if you have the option. That's a great point. I think familiarizing yourself with the fluoroscopy system that you have, uh, I think <coughs> you've come a long way from the early fluoroscopy systems. Now you can lower your frame rate significantly. Uh, you can fluorostore rather than cine uh, as much as you used to previously. Uh, and there's um, AI algorithms to, to try to reduce the exposure. So there's a variety of different approaches. And unfortunately, I feel like, it, generally speaking, in medicine, we, we expose our bodies to this without thinking through some of what we're exposing ourselves to over the course of a career or a lifetime. It's easy to think about it in one case, but harder to think about it over uh, the span of a career. Uh, there's been some literature that's come out about, you know, obviously increased cataracts in operators, increased orthopedic issues in in operators, increased uh, left-sided brain tumors in operators. Thoughts on, on that and what we need to do as a profession? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, I, you know, as somebody who's already had a cervical fusion, uh, I'm always trying to be mindful of the orthopedic impact on, um, on my occupation. But all those other occupational hazards that you have mentioned, are, I think, are very real. I mean, it's, those are things that you can't ignore, that there's this prevalence of left-sided uh, brain tumors and interventionalists and you know we our approach sometimes we we stand on the opposite side if we're working so we're not always standing on the patient's right side so that the left side is not always uh, exposed but uh, all those things are real and um, so in, a, in addition to all the radiation protection we're really kind of trying to preserve ourselves from a, a physical standpoint orthopedic standpoint because uh, those are those are all impact your longevity your uh, your ability to continue your career and, and uh, without some kind of um, protection there, you're, you're really going to find yourself uh, potentially laid up. Yep. Yeah. I think also it's, it's easy to forget when you're doing these cases, you're so focused on what's happening that oftentimes you forget where the, where's the I.I., what am I actually, how am I positioned, how am I, you know, you're wearing lead, you're leaning forward a little bit, you know, which is straining your lower low back and the, and the discs and so forth. And so I think it's, uh, you have to really make a conscious effort to really make sure you recognize where is everything in the room when you're doing these long cases because it's very easy to forget and you're in these awkward positions. And I think that's, that's a big thing. Also, I don't think we use a lot of the technology that's available. Lead hats, lead lined gloves, you know, um, side uh, protectors for radiation coming from the eye, or a scatter at least that's mm -hmm. coming. I think those are all things that maybe we need to spend more time on. Because mm -hmm. it is kind of painless, right? We don't really notice this radiation, so we don't really think about it as often. Absolutely. And I, you know, one thing that I personally feel strongly about that it's an area that's really underdeveloped. I mean, we as healthcare providers, not only physicians, as healthcare providers, we, we really focus always on the patient and doing what's best for the patient. But um, and, you know, we, we always hear about the new technologies. That's why we're here today, to learn about new technologies and, and how to help our patients. But uh, I'm going to venture and say that uh, we, as healthcare pro providers, we're not doing a good job in terms of, uh, you know, becoming innovative within that space. I don't, I, you know, there, there's a lot of tools that we can use, but I think 
part of it is it's it's not really practical. It's not really convenient for for a lot of us. Uh, that uh, you know directly taking care of a patient. So that's an area of, of research and, and, and improvement that I think industry, physicians, uh, thought leaders, entrepreneurs can can really focus on and, and do some good. You know, on that note, you mentioned that we come to meetings like this to learn about a number of different things, and there's some new systems that are out there with kind of a weightless lead system, which mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I just saw upstairs, which is very intriguing. Um, so again, from the orthopedic standpoint, it makes total sense. If you can yeah. wear lead and have its protection, but not have to bear the weight of the lead, right. that's a perfect scenario. Yep. Yeah. So there's been a lot of advances, uh, and I think cost comes into it as well, right? Uh, the added cost of this protection, but we rarely think about the cost to us over the span of a career, but we think about the cost during the case. And so, like you said, there's the lead hats, there's the, um, you know, zero gravity and weightless uh, lead uh, that you can wear. Um, have you guys incorporated any of those things into your labs or are you still using traditional uh, still shields using, and gowns? Yeah, we're, we're still using traditional lead at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I think we're always looking for potential solutions, kind of what everybody, I think the common theme that everybody's been talking about is protecting yourself yeah. uh, while you're doing the best for the patient. and. Uh, you would think that those two can marry at some point. And uh, I think that there's a lot of interest and, and uh, you're right, a, a great opportunity for researching what might be the, the next best thing. I mean, if you think about it, we have a, what, a three, four day meeting here and we, don't, we have very few lectures on radiation safety, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. it makes sense. It's kind of under, under uh, represented, I guess, as Fadi says. You need to have more awareness, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. You know, from a practical standpoint, uh, I, I've used the zero gravity system, and, and it's really a wonderful system. But but uh, that's as a cardiologist, it's it's very feasible to use it because you're kind of in a in a single location. Yeah. But when it comes to operating within the the CLI REM or peripheral vascular REM, regardless of your discipline, surgery, uh, radiology, or cardiology. Um, there's a lot of movement. You have to move, uh, you know, toward the head of a patient, toward the foot of a patient, uh, if you're having alternative access. So, so that somewhat limits these, this sure. weightless system, which, which I think they're great. They're great, but, uh, but like I said, I think there's an opportunity here to, to kind of go to the next level, more futuristic uh, um, aspects. Or right. keep your mobility yeah. while you're doing some of these long, yeah. complex cases which out, without having a, a large footprint for, uh, exactly. for a, a protection system. Yep. And on that note, perfect segue, uh, we are now in the era where we have robotic interventions, right? We now have, uh, in the US at least, approved for coronary and peripheral interventions, the core path robotic, robotic arm. Um, have you guys been exposed to that? Any thoughts on using robotics uh, to try to minimize radiation exposure and distancing yourself from the source? The only exposure to it was actually at uh, the AMP meeting a year or so ago for me, where I got to sit in the in the cockpit, so to speak, uh, taking it for a test drive, I guess. Uh, no hands-on experience in an actual case, but very intriguing technology, certainly from the standpoint of removing yourself from uh, the source of the x-ray beam. So it's uh, a lot of potential opportunity, I think. I think you guys have had some experience, right, Fadi, at yeah. your center? So, so, you know, whenever you get exposed <coughs> to new technology, um, uh, I've, I've learned this from one of my mentors, uh, you know, to, to uh, because we as physicians were always focused on the, the, the now, uh, and, and you have to look at any new technology as, well, this is, this is what it is now, but what's the potential down the road? And, and I agree with, with what Brett said, you know, we, we've used it in our center. Um, it, it's, I think it's a very promising technology. Um, but, but like everything else, it needs an infrastructure to support it. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're, you're treating a complex subset of patients, you know, from access to, to revascularization to, uh, to uh, uh, recovery. So all of those aspects, you know, require a certain infrastructure uh, below them. I think it's very promising, um, really futuristic, ahead of its time. Um, I don't think it's ready for prime time yet, but, uh, but uh, like any new futuristic technology, you know, it's, when do you ever like uh, get a technology right out of the box that's, you know, have what it takes right away, you know, usually needs a generation one, two, three, four. I'm personally excited about it. I mean, maybe one day we'll have Dr. Weckman here in Florida operating on a, on a patient in another state uh, robotically. You never know. Yeah, you never know. 
I mean, I think technology is growing at such a rapid pace, and so, the, like you said, I don't think technology is caught up with where we need to be in the complexity of procedures that we do, especially with robotics, but there is hope uh, that you could one day do, and sooner rather than later, that uh, we would be able to do remote procedures and perhaps even complex procedures uh, uh, with robotics. Um, so with that, uh, thank you gentlemen for being here and having this uh, discussion uh, with me. Uh, thank you all for listening in. Uh, we're glad that you could join us uh, on this uh, discussion about radiation exposure and safety and uh, potential solutions in the future. Thank you. <laughs>